uh, The Things I Used to Do, the story of Guitar Slim. And our uh, moderator for this panel is David Cunion, WWOZ DJ and Offbeat Magazine contributor. David uh, Cunion is an award-winning documentarian and writer who has produced radio biographies of Guitar Slim, James Booker, James Black, and Earl King, among others. And we'll let uh, David introduce the rest of our panel. Hey, how's everybody out there? Everybody all right? First of all, before we start, give it up for Dr. Ike and everyone the Ponderosa Stone. It is 10 years of total musical madness. Um, I'm David Cunion, as Jason said. To my left is... Jerry Hall. Jerry Hall. To my right... Ray Bannister. And further on? Lawrence Cotton. Um, yeah. And we are here today to talk about uh, one of the great unsung heroes of New Orleans and blues music and all that. A gentleman whose given name was Eddie Jones, but they called him Guitar Slim. So, uh, and all of these folks knew him, um, I think played with him, but we'll find that out. I wanted to start off by just asking each of you, um, I'll start with you, Mr. Cotton, how did you first meet or hear about Guitar Slam? Well, first of all, I was going to a Greenwald School of Music on Camp Street, and someone told me oh, oh, across the river, by Happy's Corral, they had a band playing over there, they were looking for a piano player. These guys were from Thibodeau. Jose Hill was the manager at, at the time. And I went over and I met, I met the guys at, 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 at uh, Happy's Corral. And they liked the way I played. And from, from time off and on, I'd go to Thibodeau and play at the Dewdrop Inn. And when Slim made the hit, the hit came out in December of 1954. And they asked me what I go on the road with him. Well, I was working at a rug company on Magazine Street, or either the Grand Elevator. I don't know which, which one I was, but I was working at the time of the day. And I was going to music school at night. So uh, they said, Cotton, could you go, go with us on, on, on the road? We'll get to Slim for a while. I said, OK. I told my wife, I said, look, babe, I'm going out on the road for a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks ended up being four years. <laughs> 1954, December 1954, December 1958, when I left. That's how, that's how it came about. Irvin, uh, how did you uh, <coughs> first meet or hear about Guitar Slam? Well, I met him at the Dewdrop. Because at that time, everybody was going in and out of the dewdrop for, for the club thing, for the band. And like I say, him and Ray Charles swapped numbers. Ray Charles did, that was Ray Charles saying the things that he used to do. And Ray Charles took his and, and, and recorded his number. I'll tell the story just once again. But you could hear Ray Charles on the end of the record. And the things I used to do when they had so much trouble getting it together. You can hear him on the end how, hey, yeah, we got it together. <laughs> what, what did I can say? It was the thing that Guitar Slim was, was one of the guitar players at that time, and the record was out, <laughs> and he was making a little money, because when he went to the Pablo, the trumpet player wanted to know how come he didn't have no, no car, or no, no school or nothing, but Guitar Slim had a Cadillac. But his record, the thing they used to do, was, was number one in the chart, so that's how he was able to get his Cadillac. Jerry, how did you first meet or hear about Guitar Slam? Six o'clock in the morning. Six o'clock in the morning. And no knowledge of the music world at all. Not involved in the music. I come out of my mom's house down the street from the grocery store and go and get bread. All I could hear is this loud, twang, screaming music. Somewhere in the, in the neighborhood, somebody's playing a guitar as loud as you could play it. <coughs> I said, what? And I'm walking, looking around, nobody. I get down two blocks, right to where the grocery store is. And um, you know how people fix a house and then make rooms on the side, they're right on the side of the house. Here's this man dressed, dressed in a green, what <coughs> color was that? I would like to be sure about it anyway. Um, yeah, he had a dark, a, a 
bright green jacket on with an orange shirt, bright yellow shoes, and a yellow hat, and this purple tie around here. And he got it all broke open like that. And he's playing on this guitar loud as you want. I looked at him, he's sitting on the doorstep on one of these rooms. And he's got his guitar amplifier out in front of him like that. Two of them, nice big ones. And he had them as loud as he could get them. And he was playing this guitar. And I looked at him, I said, who are you? Well, where did you come from? I said, I ain't never seen nothing like you around here before, you know. So I stopped by him and I listened to him. And he was playing. And when he saw me standing there, he said, bust up in a big <coughs> grin. And he started singing. I don't know what he was singing. I'm just listening. So I waved at him and said, I gotta go. Went in the grocery store, come back. He's still playing and still singing. Okay, went on about my business, went on, brought the bread. About two years later, my husband and I break up. I didn't see this man around the neighborhood again. But two years later, I got babies, they were growing. We break up. I move away from the neighborhood. I wound up uptown at the Dew Drop. One night, I think it was near the weekend, and they had a, on the marquee, Guitar Slim, and this man's picture. I said, so this is Guitar Slim. So that's who I saw sitting in the doorway, Guitar Slim. Okay. So we come to the do drop that night. And sure enough, it was Guitar Slim, and it was his band, and he was loud and bright. <laughs> and it was beautiful to me because I had never, ever heard anybody play like that. And I had never, I mean, I was all into the music, work with me and in. This one and that one and the other one and Ray Charles, but Guitar Slim I hadn't ever seen and nothing like him. He was one of a kind. Yes, he was. And I really enjoyed him. I never got the chance to know him, though it was about maybe seven or eight months later. And that was another story. Well, you said you had never seen or heard anyone like him. I want to ask y'all, when you first heard him or you were playing with him, Lawrence, was there anyone else out there doing anything, doing the kind of thing he was doing? Well, no, I, I, I wasn't aware of, of that. We played at the Dewdrop Inn, and uh, they'd have a show. They didn't have any guitar players on the, on the stage. They'd have, uh, uh, yeah, if I remember right, it was uh, James Prevost, he was a, a bass player. Frank Mitchell, he was a trumpet player. Herbert Hardesty, he was a saxophone player. And had another guy, they, they called him Snow. I think his name was Oliver, Oliver Berry, I think. Yeah, drummer. He was a drummer. And they would play for the dancers. They always have a, what you would call an exotic dancer. She'd come out and dance. Then they had a, a, a comedian, Lollipop Jones. He, he was on the show. But there weren't any guitar players on it. So the only time when I, when, I, when I went on the road, the first time I went on the road, we went directly to the Apollo Theater. And that's when I first heard guitar slam. <laughs> was he used to playing bright like that? And then, uh, I mean, you know, he was loud. He was loud. He was really brassy. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if that was how he played. Irvin, have you ever heard, when you first heard Guitar Slim, and you ever heard anything like it? Was anyone playing like that? Well, he was at the Dew Drop, and really, he didn't get that, really that loud, but he had a different way of playing because he played with the clamp on his guitar all the time. But when I got in the service, they told me to throw that clamp in the corner because you couldn't play down behind it. You could, play, or you could go up, but you couldn't ever go behind the clamp. So I got rid of the clamp and I fell from in the service. <laughs> but outside of that, he was supposed to be one of the best guitar players that they had at, 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 at that time. Yeah. So everybody was listening to that guitar slam. Let me interject this. When, uh, Slim was on that show. We played all the songs that he played, and 
for their finale. Charlie Barnett's band he was in the background. And Slim, when he finished his song, we were in the key of B flat. And he was supposed to stop. And then the band would modulate to D flat and we'd take it out. But Slim didn't know, because like he said, he had a clamp. He played with a clamp on, on the guitar. And uh, when, when he finished the song, he's making all kind of noise, so somebody cut him off. Then uh, Raw, I forgot his name, he, he made a modulation and everybody in the band went into the key of uh, D flat and he swung it out. But he said he couldn't do that anymore. He, he just was, I didn't, um, it wasn't anything wrong with what he was playing. It's just that he was playing. I mean, he was very bright. He always came way up high. And I thought that was great myself. I said, this is a brand new thing. He was, what was he like as a stage performer? When Slim came, he came from Mississippi. I understand he was born in Mississippi. And he was a dancer over there. And he, when he stand, stood up, he, his legs swayed back. And a lot of people was expecting him to fall, but he never did fall. <laughs> and uh, he, was, he was a great performer. And what happened, he'd always have uh, somebody, he had a long cord on his, on his guitar, and he had a guy from Mississippi, his name was Jimmy. Jimmy would carry him on his shoulder, and he'd parade all around. He had the people like a Pied Piper. They'd follow him everywhere he went, and that's, that's how good he was. Remember, do you remember anything about seeing him perform? Like I say, everybody used to watch Slim when he get on the stage and perform because they had never seen that kind of guitar player before. Because if you take like most of the guitar players, they were standing up. But the guitar Slim would like, like go around or go outside the door with a long cable and come back inside. But sometimes when he come back in, he stayed out too long there and changed the number. <laughs> they were playing something different. But he had the long cord and he would always go out the door at the dew drop, stand outside playing until they cut him off. And then when he come back in, they was doing something else, but he was still a good performer. <laughs> Jerry, you've never seen anyone play like guitar slip with that time? No. And I wasn't used to um, bands or anything like that. My being in, my going to dances here with a band, you know, something like that. I understood the band because I knew June Garden and I knew um, Billy Diamond. They used to come to the club and, and you'd go to the club and see them. And they came to school. I was in high school. They'd come to the, you know, they played and everything. And I was used to a normal band. But when I saw that man sitting at the, in that door, I said, well, where does he work and what does he do? I found out <laughs> two, three years later up at the dude drop. He did, just like they say, out on the sidewalk, hollering and screaming, playing real loud. But he was a good performer, and his music was good. Um, what, what was his personality like? What, what was he like as a person? How would you describe him? He was great. He was a great guy. Although he, he did some crazy things, <laughs> but he was a religious man, believe it or not. He could recite the 23rd song word for word. I mean, in his, in his spare time, I mean, he, he, he ended the Bible. A lot of people didn't know that. But he was something else. He was fine. What were some of the crazy things he would do? Oh, man. <laughs> <coughs> well, he was, uh, I can't think of the other guitar player. What's the guy you used to play with, Gary? His Brown. Gabe Mouth Brown. He, he tried to follow what Gabe Mouth Brown did. Gabe Mouth, uh, and he, he dressed his car, whatever car, is, is whatever color the car was, he'd get the Super Sam color, he'd, his shoes would be the same way, he'd dye his hair the same way. Those were the kind of th things that he did. So he had a certain kind of sartorial style. Oh yes, said. oh yes. Irvin, did you ever see him or know him to do any, what was his personality like? As you, did you get to know him? But he used to urinate in his wine so nobody else would drink it. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody didn't drink it either. He always had a whole 
box of toilet paper in the back of the Cadillac. I had arrangements to go on the road with him for about a week, seven, eight days. We went up to uh, St. Louis, Missouri, and um, Kansas City, and other parts of Louisiana. And his drummer was good friends to me, him and his old lady. And Slim would holler, stop the call, stop the call. I was gonna say, oh no. <laughs> yeah, pull over, let him go. Yeah. Where's the music roll? Where's the music roll? I was gonna say, he popped the, um, the lock on the Cadillac. And he, <laughs> Slim would get out the back seat of the car and go in the back seat. And off in the woods, he'd have business. And he would stay going back there, and, ooh, sometime he'd stay there a half hour, just fiddling around. Ask her, ask him, say, man, you didn't, you didn't have to take that much time off our time. We don't have that much time. He said, well, you know me. When I get to fiddling, I fiddle. And throw, throw the toilet paper in the back seat, get in the car, let's go. That's it. <laughs> he was a character. <laughs> Let me, let me tell you a story about Slim. Slim bought a, 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 a Rocket 88. I forgot what year it was. But anyway, he wanted to get to the New Jersey Turnpike. And he had a driver that drove him everywhere he wanted to go. But I was riding with him one time. But he started, he said, let me drive. This, this is my car, Rocket 88. So when he got on the Turnpike, he thought he could just drive as fast as he wanted. You know, the speed I'm to had maybe 130 miles on. And he looked at it, and I guess he thought he could drive as fast as what he saw. <laughs> so then we, on a, we were going to New York at no particular time. And then the next thing I know, ah, there the police got us. Turn us around, go back 20 miles to the opposite way. Had a kangaroo coat on the side. He paid his $100, we got back in the car, and Slim didn't drive anymore. <laughs> <laughs> when, um, what were the audience reactions to him when he would play? I see he had him, he had him in the palm of his hand. When we were in California the first time we had gone out there, we played San Jose. Ray Charles, he, he was based up in, in uh, uh, Seattle. Between Seattle and, and, and San Diego, that's where Ray Charles was uh, going up down the coast, singing like Ray, uh, like uh, Nat King Cole and, and, and uh, Charles Brown. So he came to this this club where we this, this city where we were, and uh, what I wanted to say uh, when Ray Charles did his thing, because he, he was familiar with the band, because they lived in Ray Charles lived in New Orleans a good while at Falsas, which was about two three blocks away from the Do Drop. And uh, he was very familiar with the, the Hosea Hills and Lloyd Lambert's band, so they knew his music. So he, he appeared on, on the show during that. Now when he, when he got down, Slim got up there. There was a lot of Spanish people up there. And Slim had Jimmy carry him on and on, you know, with the, with the long wire and everything. He had him in the palm of his hand. He could have led him right out to the Pacific Ocean out there. That's how good he was. Oh, yeah. He had magic with his music. He just, he was like the Pied Piper. He could just draw you in. Let's go, you're doing. That's the way, that's the way Slim was. Across, across the river over in Bachery, you know, they had rapsters up there. It, 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 it was not closed in like this. They had rapsters up there before you put stuff up. And he, he'd <laughs> hang up there, and the guitar be straying on him, and, and, and everybody be in a frenzy just watching what he did. I mean, he had, he had the people, man. He was something else, something to see. Tell us about some of his dreams that you know he was riding the car. And there was another thing about Slim in the studio, they had to put pillows on his feet because he stumped so bad. And then he would get over the recording. So they started putting the pillows on his feet. But outside of that, outside of stumping, he still did his thing. Well, what happened is when they first recorded the things I used to do, all, all uh, in the studio, they would go in and every, uh, before they get to the end of the song, he would stop. And uh, Ray said, no, 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 keep on going, going, and he stopped. So the man said, look, we, we spent about six, eight hours in here doing it. Let's come back tomorrow. 
So they came back the next day, and about two takes, when they got the last part of the song, I just can't get along with you. Da 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 da. Yeah! That's Ray Charles hollering on the funny record. It took him two days to make that song. And the camera hit. Yeah. Um, I was going to bring this up later, since, but since the name Ray Charles came up, um, do you think that Guitar Slim had a certain influence on Ray Charles? Yes, he did, because he, 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 the, the theme song that we had, Wonderless, he took, Ray Charles used that as his theme when he got his big band. Because a guy from uh, uh, De uh, Denver, he, wrote, he was a writer of the song, and he used that as his theme, the theme song that we had. And let me tell you about a dream that, that uh, that Slim had. Uh, I was driving a car farm. No particular time. I don't know if you were heading we probably to New York, because we always in, in back and forth into New York. Uh, I was driving, and Slim kept reaching for the steering wheel. So I pulled on the side and said, Slim, wake up, wake up, Slim. He said, what's the matter, man, what's the matter? I said, man, you were dreaming. I guess you were dreaming, I guess. He said, yes, I was. I said, what were you dreaming? He said, man, a beautiful woman was coming. She was approaching me. She was coming towards me. And just at the time I'm about to kiss her, she turned into a weird creature. And he jumped, that's when he jumped, you know. I said, hey, man, what you? I said, look, if you want me to continue to drive, you get on the back seat, because I, 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 I can't drive with you grabbing that steering wheel. That's what happened. Uh, Earl King told me that Slim told him he had a dream of that the, the devil came to him with a song, and that God came to him with a song. And, um, and Guitar Slim said, you know, I'm gonna take the devil's song. Um, and that was the things that I used to do. That's what, that's what he said, that's came what he to told me. Dream. That's what Earl King told me about Slim, so. Well, he told me, he said, God, he said, you're going to outlive me. I said, why is that Slim? He said, I'm living two days till you're one. I said, how are you doing that? And it's true. Every city provided him with a woman or two, or three. <laughs> Everywhere he went, he had to have somebody, and he drank, and that's, that's what happened with him. He was a womanizer. He also drank a lot, as they said. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Did, um, did he ever tell any of y'all about his history, where he came from, you know, what his life in Mississippi was like? Before he got to New Orleans, or how he got to New Orleans? No, he never tell me. To, he never tell me anything. All I know is when he came to New Orleans, he had, there was a club back there. Uh, uh, forget the name of it. Let me think about it. He never was personal about himself. He never gave you any information about who he was, or his background, or his people. You never heard anything like that from him. And we talked a lot when we were going uh, on the road that day with us, Oscar. We talked about everything and all kind of things, but he never talked about his personal thing. The club I was thinking about was the Tijuana Club. A lot of people just go back to, the but besides the dude drop in, they'd go back to the Tijuana Club, and Clem would go back there. And anyway, he could play his guitar, he would play. That, that's where he was. Y'all were saying how you have, um, were in the studio with him. Did you have any, any other memories about being in the studio with him or what they had to do to record him or what that was like? Oh, no, uh, we were somewhere up in New York and had a guy on crutches. And he was the one who brought this song, If I Had My Life to Live Over. I remember being in the studio when you did that. If I had my life to do over, I would do it the same thing again. That's mm -hmm. one thing. That's one. But we did, I did a lot of recordings with, with him. But I can't tell you all the studio the way they were. We were working out of, of uh, uh, Shaw Agency, 5, 565 Fifth Avenue. They were the one with Booker's. And they, 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 they were in the office, man. They saw right here, man. They sat down right with the paper from here to Tallahassee. For them on the paper, man, it looked, looked like it's just over there. But in a car, man, you got to take a long ride to get over there, you know. That's the only thing I didn't like about what, the way they booked us sometimes. Could you tell us something about all right, there's another thing. Slim apparently was drunk one time, riding on the, on a, uh, the South Street, 
he ran into a bulldozer, boom. <laughs> and he ended up in the charity hospital for about two months. And our, our, our leader, our manager, Jose Hill from Thibodeau, he and I were standing in front of the dewdrop. He said, Cotton, he said, we, uh, I have some dates on, on Slim that I don't know whether I should cancel them or should we go. I said, wait a minute, Slim. I said, the guy, the guy upstairs, I was talking about Earl King. I said, Earl King looked something like Slim. He's dark like him. He wore his hair like him. And he liked everything that Slim did. So I went, he said, go get him. So I went and got and, and Earl convinced uh, uh, Jose that, that, that he could do it. So then we had a job in Bessemer, Alabama. But uh, one thing I didn't know, that Ray Charles was supposed to meet us. They had another guy, he was working at the dude route. His name was Dragnet Allen. Jesse Allen. Jesse oh, Allen. Okay, Jesse Dragnet Allen. That's what he called himself. So when we got to uh, Westman, the band, we had uh, two suits. One was a green suit with a yellow tie, one was a rust suit with a red tie. So in the meantime, we played uh, Saginaw, Michigan, and had the guys standing in front of the bandstand watching everything Slim did. And uh, you know, later on, several months later on, when we, when we on our way to Bessemer, who was out in the audience but this guy that, that, that saw Slim? Now, the bandstand was like up, up, up as high as what we are right now. And he was like over there, standing up there looking. So we put the green suit on, and we played about 15 minutes. We played about 15 minutes before we, we called Jesse Allen up. And then Ray Charles, you know, he plays piano. I'm playing the piano, so I had my back turned to, to the audience because I didn't want people. Because <laughs> Ray Charles played piano, he's supposed to be at the piano playing. And, and, and Jesse Allen's over here standing in the middle with a, with a microphone with dog glasses on. Well, he knew all the Ray Charles songs, the band knew because they were very familiar with Ray Charles. So we finally got over that at intermission time. We went in, we changed uniform, we put the rust, rust uh, uniform with the red tie. We came out, we played about 15 minutes. Then we brought Earl King acting as Guitar Slim. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I mean, we, we, we knew the music, I mean, because we played with him. So this guy over there, he looked up. That ain't no Guitar Slim. That ain't no Guitar Slim. So I told Gus he was an announcer. I said, Gus called our manager who was way back at the, at the front door. So Jose came back there and took the guy, brought him in the back. They must have paid him off or something because <laughs> those people would have killed us if they were really know what we were doing. <laughs> but thank God we got by with that, with that situation. <laughs> Earl King told me, I think it was in Bessemer, that he wet his guitar slim and then like two months later came in the same club as um, Earl King. And the club would have looked at him and gone, Wait, wait, wait. Were you guitar slim last week? <laughs> <laughs> Who are you this week? Okay. Don't forget the time Earl told me that when he was in Atlanta at the Royal Peacock, that there were some people from New Orleans walked up to him in the bar and said, You're not guitar slim. And Earl just he couldn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> what can you do at that point? <laughs> um, Irvin, did you? When you used to see him, or did you have any memories of the studio work, or seeing him, working with him or seeing him lot? I never did see him in the studio, but he was at the dude drop almost looked like every weekend, because I was playing him with the Richard and different ones at the, at the time. But uh, like I said, Slim would come in, and everybody would, would weapon him, because he was a good entertainer. It's also, I mean, like you guys said, he was a really good dancer, too. Oh, yeah, he was a good dancer. Do you um, got any other tales, Mr. Cotton, about being on the road with him or things like that? Uh, no, I already told you the things. I already told you the things that, that the three things that he told me that I, 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 I would outlive him. But he's always uh, when he was on the road. I brought my work, my wife out the last year, 1958. She came out for the last year that we were on the road. And when Slim gets broke, he said, Miss Cotton, I need fifty dollars. Let me have fifty dollars. I'll give you more money when I get it back. My wife would say, Look, just give me my whatever you borrow, just give it back to me. That's the only thing that I, I can remember. Um, near the kind of end of his career, the end of his life, he moved down to Thibodeau, right? Yes, yes. He, 
Yeah, he did live, he, he moved to Thibodeau. He met a girl from uh, somewhere in Michigan, and, and her name was Rose, and he kind of shacked up with her for a while. He kind of settled down a little bit. I quit the band in, in uh, December 5th, 1958, and two months later, February 1959, that's when he died. I heard Eddie Lee talking about it on the, on the radio the other day, right. what it, how, how it went about. Um, do you remember the last time you saw him? Yeah, the last time I saw him was when I quit. December, 1958. Mm -hmm. He was buried a little bit out of Thibodeau, in Thibodeau at least, not too far from the club, where Jose Hill buried him at out there in Thibodeau, not where he was from, but wherever he was from, but they buried him in Thibodeau. Well, let me tell you, all of, the whole band, let me, let me mention the names. Uh, Jose Hill had a club in, 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 the, in the, uh, Thibodeau. It was a, a hotel, a restaurant. He had everything he needed at the place. He had two buses. He was ahead of his time. And he put Thibodeau on the map with, with the guitar slam. Is that the, the Sugar Bowl? Or the that Sugar Bowl, Sugar Bowl. On, on Guard Street. It was Guitar Slim, Eddie Jones, he played the guitar, with Lord Lambert, the band leader. It was me, Lawrence Cotton on piano, Oscar Moore on drum, and on the horns, he had Gus Fountain at the alto player, and he also announced when, uh, when we had do anything. Joe Tillman and Miller Sam, they both were tenor people. Clarence Ford and Edward Kid John Jordan were baritone. And uh, like I'm saying, Jose Hill, his sidekick was Eddie Thompson, who's still alive. He lives over across the river. He was the one talking about, that I think Slim died in his arms up there. Yeah, I think he, last time I checked, he was managing the Azalea Bingo Hall. But all these people are buried in, in, in uh, Thibodeau, except Miller Sam, because Miller Sam was up in Detroit but all the rest of them, and it's about three or four blocks from where the Sugar Bowl used to be. But right now, it's nothing but an uh, empty lot. Jerry, we're saying, do you, we're gonna ask you, do you have any more memories of you know being on the road with Slim, or what he was like? No, not too much. Uh, after that time, I went on the road with Slim uh, that week. I didn't see any, anything of Slim for about maybe a year or two. And uh, he had been gone for quite a while. Uh, I had an opportunity to meet his son and his wife. Uh, one night we, him and his, him, uh, he had a gig at the, at the Dewdrop. And uh, I met his wife, Annabelle. He had a nice wife. She was real nice, but she was kind of dingy. And uh, <laughs> she would get crazy on you if she thought you liked Slim. <laughs> and she would, you know, when she look at you funny like that. But when she found out that I knew Slim, you know, a woman, strange women, she came around, she took a look at me, she asked me how I was and all this and who I was. And, but it wasn't ever anything more than that. And then I learned later that Slim had a daughter who could play drums and she can play. That's been a while and that, that has been some time. But uh, Slim was still alive and kicking when I first met her. But he didn't want her to play. And uh, Lil and his son, Adolf, Adolf plays well, but Adolf is another strange one. He don't talk a lot, but he likes you. And if he likes you, you gotta watch him because he'll stay around you a long time. <laughs> Can't get rid of him, he gets like a, a leech. But he's still good people. And you don't say things like that about people that you like. And me and, me and Adolf's good friends. That's all I can say. This is the way Slim would operate. We were coming out of Florida one time. I had a lady. It was around winter time. She got in the car. We went all the way up to New York. When he got to New York, he met somebody else, and she had to get out the room while he took care of business. When he left there, he he go to some every city provided a woman or two or three. That's the way he was. Um, do y'all um, hear the influence of Guitar Slim and? Anybody who came after him, or we're talking about Ray Charles, but you know anybody else or anybody even today? I think Buddy Guy copied after him. I think that's that's the only one I can I, I kind of relate Buddy Guy to the way that he does. Now when we were in uh, we were in uh, Thibodeau, no, we Howard Lewis was a, a promoter over in Texas. He and Jose Hill got together, and they decided that they're gonna book three people together, three artists. It was Guitar Slim, T. 
Trayvon walk and Joe Thomas. And the people tried to get to the clubs wherever they were, like the hair on your head. Everywhere we played, the place was packed and jammed. And the people up in New York, after they, they saw that was going on, that's, that's, I think we were the first one to start packaging all this stuff together. I wanted to ask y'all one more question before we open it up to um, uh, the audience here. Um, given how great Guitar Slim was, and that he was unique and, and, a, and a pioneer in the, way he, in the music and the way he performed, why do you think more people don't know about him? He seems to be more, much more obscure than he should be, given who he was. I don't know where things are going today. They're playing all kind of music, man, so I, I just don't know. I don't know, man. It's, it, sometimes they play his music, sometimes they don't. So I, I, I can't, I can't relate to that. <coughs> what it was the studio, uh, the, the different recording studio that it was in the studio at least when they did the recording on Slim. They always had him down there as a good guitar player, but they were small labels. That's why he didn't get the recognition that he really was supposed to get because he was on a small label. People on, the, on on bigger labels, they they didn't really you know was listening at the rhythm and blues then at that time. You're gonna say something, Jerry, or no? I thought I thought better of it. I don't <laughs> want to say that. It's not that anything. Might be a first. It's not anything um, pertinent to what we were talking about. It's just I remember a few. Uh, about a couple of weeks or so before Slim died. He started coming around the dew drop and all of us were at the dew drop. For some strange reason, we were just there. And uh, Slim started coming in every day. And his partner, Earl King, he, he, had, he would come in the door asking for Earl, where's Earl, where's Earl? And we'd have to go and find Earl for him. He loved Earl King. And Earl would sit down and talk to him uh, whatever misgivings were going on in his mind, Earl could always soothe them. And uh, I wasn't living around the Duke Drop, but I was coming there. Everybody was coming there regularly. It seemed something was going on. And um, one day I went there, and he was standing at the bar. He had on a powder blue suit. Clean, clean. Had never seen him like that. He would always, he was just, in other words, he was like, getting ready to go take care of some business, he looked. I said, what's the matter with you, Slim? Hi, that was all. I'm waiting for Earl, all right. Go find Earl, go find Earl for me, all right. So we go and we find Earl. Earl said, the man, Slim, I'm sick. Yes, he's here. This, things went on like that for about three weeks. And one time he came into place and he threw a fit in the place. He went screaming and hollering, and everybody went running. Nobody could stop him. They had to call the police, and they put him in Flint Goodrich Hospital. And that is the last time I knew anything about him. Next thing I knew, he had passed. That was it. Do you have any questions from anybody in the audience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, gentlemen with the microphone, so. Um, um, Mr. Cotton, since you mentioned T-Bone Walker, I, I wonder if you can, uh, if you know this story that I heard uh, about a time at some club that uh, Guitar Slim appeared with T-Bone Walker and B.B. King and Lowell Folsom, and the story goes that Guitar Slim said to them, well, here we are, you're, you're the three best guitar players in the world, but when I get finished, no one is going to remember anything that any of you did. I don't remember that. <laughs> does does that so. sound like the, the, like the sort of uh, personality that he was? No, uh, uh, T-Bone Walker was a hell of a guy. He tried to get Slim to take the choke off, off, off the guitar. You know what I mean? If you say, for instance, this is a guitar, and you put, uh, this is a key of C. That's a key of C. So then you know you only have three changes in blues, one, four, and five. So that would be C. F and G7. So once you, you get that, that's the C. Whenever you hit it, brown, that's going to be C. Then you have, to, you have to find out where F is. And once you find out, then you find it because G is right next to it. 
but he would never let T-Bone show him how to play correctly. And that's where he played all the time with the, with the choke on the, on the guitar, a clamp. A clamp. Hi, I was just, uh, I've done a lot of research on guitar slim. I just wanted to say that, um, add a little bit follow up on what Lawrence said about um, um, Slim's religious background. Supposedly he was actually a preacher in Mississippi for a time, like, probably like Jerry Lee Lewis was a preacher for a little while. But anyway, uh, and uh, he started out imitating Gate Mouth Brown, even like his theme song I was uh, on Gate. And, I'm a guitar slim, come to your town, just like Gate Mouth Brown's song of the similar lyric. But anyway, he did the first real hit that he had was a song called Feeling Sad in 1953, and it was not a big hit, but it was a regional hit in the South. And that uh, Dr. John actually called that the first real soul record because it's got a heavy gospel sound to it, moaning gospel sound. And that is actually the song that Ray Charles covered of Guitar Slim's at Cosmo Studios, almost the only thing that Ray Charles did at Cosmos, and uh, Guitar Slim was present at the session. And uh, there's a, a break in uh, Ray Charles' version, which Ray Charles actually breaks down in the, in the piano break and says, pray with me, boys, please pray with me. If you ever listen to the Ray Charles' version of that, it's feeling sad. Anyway, uh, so that, that gospel component was very significant to his to his sound, and you can kind of even hear that in things I used to do, because it's almost like a sinner's prayer. Things I used to do, Lord, I ain't gonna do no more. And of course, things I used to do was covered by every blues person in history, including B.B. King and Jimi Hendrix, who he probably had a little influence on, as far as the wild stage act. So uh, anyway, that's, that's uh, Keith Richards did it, okay. But virtually every person had anything to do with the blues, so James Brown, everybody has done things I used to do. And so his influence is actually still immense because anybody that does blues has done that song and probably other guitar Slim songs. Well, Slim, he influenced a lot of people with his playing and songs. He's got quite a few songs and have some f a powerful meaning for what he's saying. Mm -hmm. He came out, uh, he wanted to do like, the farmers, you know, uh, with the straw hat, the, 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 the uh, overalls, red handkerchief in the pocket. And he, he started singing that. When he finished it, when he came off the stage, Schiffman, who was on the Apollo Theater, told him, said, look, we, you can't come on stage dressed like that anymore. We got too many suits, too many manufacturers up here. Don't you ever come on my stage singing like that but it was a very powerful song, like you said. Yeah, a lot of his songs, they, they have a lot of deep meaning too. Oh, yes. You know, they're, yes. they're simple, but yeah. you know, they say a lot. Right now, when um, Adolf gets upset, he'll find me, talk to me about my daddy. Talk to me about my daddy. Tell me why I'm so much like my daddy. <clears throat> I'm talking about his son. He's just like Guitar Slim. And he's very, very sensitive and very psychic, very. But when he gets worried about Slim, now how he runs into me, I don't know. And he'll say, I'm like my daddy. I like Earl King. I wish Earl was around. I wish I had Earl to talk to right now. I'm talking about right now. I will run into him on the street and wonder, how in the world did you find me? And I have to give him some time because he'll ask me all kinds of questions about Slim right now. <coughs> the other more questions? Yes, I was wondering, did the guitar Slim it, it, uh, mix with the fans and the clubs? Did he have much to say with him or was he always in a hurry to leave? I didn't follow that, what you said. Slim always, Slim always went by himself. You had to follow him. He didn't go with anybody else. But I tell you, uh, 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 Ru oh, Russ, he was talking about the Chisholm Circuit. We, we came down the Chisholm Circuit too. 
you play New York and you go you go to Washington D.C. and you come down right down the line, the East Coast all the way down. When you get to Jacksonville, the top of Florida, you play all the way down to the Miami. Then you come back around the side through Fort Myers up to St. Petersburg and into Tallahassee, then to uh, Alabama and to Louisiana and, and back to Thibodeau. That's where everything stopped in Thibodeau. Then we either either going west or we going east. And we did that for four years and I was out there. It's true, you can't really go south from Thibodeau too far. <laughs> No, 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 I mean, we, we go to Thibodeau and we stop and we play in New Orleans. We play in Thibodeau and all the people around would come to see the guitar sound. I mean, anybody we had, I don't care, Joe Tex, uh, uh, Bobby Bland, whoever we had, Slim always outdrew everybody when they, when they played out there. That's what it was. Yep. Awesome. This, this isn't a very deep question. But uh, you were you were talking earlier about Slim's unique fashion sense uh, with his yellow hat and green shirt and purple tie, and I was wondering if there was a particular place that you could shop for clothes like that in New Orleans back then. I mean, where would you buy an outfit like that? No, Slim would buy the clothes. I mean, you know, he, he whatever idea he he take the shoes. He would get blue shoes or he he paint. He go buy paint, paint the shoes blue. <laughs> Uh, red, he would paint the shoes red. I mean, he, he would go to downtown and buy the store. He'd buy the shoes that he had and he'd paint them. Now, I don't know where you can buy clothes like that today. I really don't know. In Houston, Texas, and in Memphis, Tennessee, they have shops that have uh, suits like that. Because I remember working with um, Solomon Burt. Joe Tex and Edward Davis was the manager to the group at that time, and uh, we stopped in two different shops. They're not too far from one another, but it's in Memphis, Tennessee. And if you could buy, you know, those bright colors, they'd have them. You could get them. You could order them from them. They didn't have them in the shop. They'd order them. Is that a last There's a place right across from the um, Madison Hotel. I got I. <laughs> I don't know anything about it. I just remember that they had them. Yeah, and they still have that one. It's in the old shopping center. In the old downtown where the streetcar goes by. I don't know. I can't tell you because I was riding in a Cadillac and it was only for a minute that I was there. I just remember that uh, they went there and ordered some things because Solomon used to go there and buy things. Edward took him down there, and I was riding in the Cadillac with him. Yeah, any time Slim bought a Cadillac, he had, had to have a kid on the back. I don't know if you guys know what the kid is. On the back of it, he always had that on his car. He had to have a Cadillac kid on the back of his car. Another question. Do you all know guitar uh, Slim Jr.? That's the young man I was calling Adolf. That's his name, Adolf. He's still around, right? Yes, he is. He's still around, but I don't let him know who I am. He's <laughs> like a leech. Yeah, I, played, I played with him like three or four months ago. He's still, he's a very good guitar player, but he can't leave the bottle alone. And very good guitar player, but drunk. I think he was up for some kind of award, and he went out there, he thought he was going to get the award. He was just, uh, 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 he got he mad. He, he got mad. I mean, you know, he's supposed to get right. it. Yeah. 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 I think you're right. Guitar Slim Jr. had an album nominated for a Grammy maybe yeah. 10, 15 years ago, I think. Yeah, I played it on that record. He went to the Grammys and he wanted that nomination. He had no trouble for a nomination. <laughs> he was just a nominated. He didn't get the nomination. He got mad and angry about it. Yeah. 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 He thought he was going to get drunk. He was just nominated, that's all. He didn't know he's going to get drunk. Any more questions for anybody? Up in the front. When you were on tour in the 50s, how many shows per month or per 
year, how many days would you be playing? Oh, when we went to the Pilot Theater, you play a whole week. We stayed at the Teresa Hotel the first time we went up there, and then later on we went to various hotels in the neighborhood. But we played, any time you went to a place, we played play Gleason in Cleveland, and I mean, different places we'd go, you'd play a, a week. We went down to Florida, there was a place called Hollandale. We'd go down and play there a whole week. We, we, we went, that's what we did. Five shows a day. Yeah. You talked about Gatemouth Brown um, maybe being one of his influences, and certainly I think of Gatemouth Brown as you know having the look of a rock star, and uh, maybe that's maybe that was something that he did, you know he took in. Can you, can you elaborate on some of his other influences musically? On Slim's influences. <laughs> Some other, what other, what were some of Slim's other influences? What were some of Slim's other influences? I know we were in Kansas City one time and, and, and uh, the man just called, he uh, started coaching Slim on the guitar. That's crazy words. And when uh, we were in West Virginia, he was playing with a, a you got me riding, what's his name? Uh, Jimmy Lee. Jimmy Lee. Jimmy Reed. Then Slim did it, did it to Jimmy Reed. Da, 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 da. <laughs> he cursed him. <laughs> Anybody else? All right, y'all. Jerry Hall, Lawrence Cotton, Urban Bannister. My name is David. <laughs>